There's a part deep down in each of us which is unique. And for Elizabeth Peterson, founder of the South African Faith and Family Institute, her journey was clear from early on. Today she heads up an organization that brings together many faiths. It's a place where she can express her deepest and richest calling to help others. So Elizabeth, if I had to imagine the perfect space for you to do your work. This is, this is perfect. It's such a very important part of Cape Town. Absolutely, absolutely. And just being here in District 6 with the complex history of our country, but also sharing a space with the Western Cape Religious Leaders Forum and Cape Town Interfaith Initiative is absolutely perfect. Elizabeth was born into a humble, loving home with eight siblings. Her family was deeply religious with strong ties to the Pentecostal church. From early on, she learned the value of family and building a future. What I always appreciate about my parents, they were young then in their 20s, but they knew that it was important for us to go to school. And even if it meant that we had to live with my grandmother in Hanover Park, during the week, go to school. Every Friday they would bring us back. We would be together on weekends. In 1988 was the first time when we had this council house after they've been waiting for 16 years that we actually were together as a family. I was eight. <laughs> Elizabeth was always a deep-thinking child, looking for answers in her own quiet way. As teens, she and her sister Susan ministered together in their church. Was she different to the other eight of you? I would say so, yes. She was, she was fairly quiet. She, she, she really went for, for the peaceful play. That's how she was. Girly, playful, in the sand, um, very mindful, always. And then one day Elizabeth had a powerful experience, unusual for someone so young. It was something that shaped her life ever since. What I remember of my childhood was when I was playing in the sand, you know, it's like sort of a, a little tin. For some reason I had this ache in my heart. What was the feeling that you were feeling so strongly? And I had this extraordinary sense of, I'm supposed to help people. I actually had this weird notion that it was just me and God. She was eight years old. She was eight years old. Yeah, and she was so sure of that and convinced at the time she's going to be helping people, and it would have been a different kind of help to a different kind of people. Growing up in the Pentecostal church, there was a group of men who, some of them had just come from prison, hectic guys who had been there for rape and all sorts of murder and different things and chuppies with tattoos all over the, the face and so forth. And so Susan would say, we need to go and spend time with these guys. Now, on this one occasion, all we had to do was had them listen to a gospel song and we would rewind the tape and say did you hear the message did you hear the words of the song when I think back and I look at the work that I'm doing with perpetrators of domestic violence I often think that a lot of that work started probably way back then Elizabeth was a student leader in high school during the 1980s for the first time she felt a discomfort realizing the vast difference between the messages in her church and her allegiance to the anti-apartheid struggle. There was a conflict in high school because on the one hand you were the head of the SRC and there was all the politics and what was going on in South Africa, but in your home church community, it was very different. I knew that, you know, we had to be free because actually we were created free. But for the church, I wasn't supposed to be in the SRC because in those days the SRC was quite involved in you know the anti-apartheid struggle and very clear emphasis was on we ought to be praying for our government we need to pray for our leaders so you cannot challenge leaders it was very confusing um, on the one hand what was always encouraged you must 
walk in a personal relationship with God. You must have your quiet time with God. And you must figure out what God's purpose for your life is. But when it comes to the practice, you know, you had to do it in a particular frame. Elizabeth was the first in her family to go to university. And when she graduated as a social worker, she began working at a shelter in Cape Town for abused women with children. To the class, my studies, to go work as a volunteer. Waar enige ouder verwacht nou, die kind is nou klaar gestudeerd, haar met de inkomst is. En toen zei ze, we werken als een volunteer. Hij had ons nog altijd voor dixie en trainvee gegeven om te doen wat zij eigenlijk willen doen. St. Anne's is a place where women come to find their feet. It's also a place that revealed for Elizabeth the realities of family violence and its horrific effects. She was seeing and experiencing things she'd never encountered before and it was life-changing. Walking into St. Anne's, first couple of years, listening to the woman, I was, I couldn't believe what was happening in people's intimate relationships. I couldn't believe that there were women with children who had given their lives into intimate relationships and that was met with brutality, with rape, with violence, with shaming, you know, and, and rejection and abandonment. That shook me, it woke me up from, you know, I could never be a regular social worker. I realized if I was going to be of any use to the women, I would have to let them teach me. As a newly qualified social worker, Elizabeth Peterson began working at a shelter for abused and pregnant women in Cape Town. It was a place where a calling since childhood to help others could be realized, and where she quickly learned the harsh realities of many women's lives. After three years of being a social worker at St. Anne's, I was appointed as the director of St. Anne's, and then, you know, the rest of my time, altogether, about 14 years there, and I heard a lot, I've seen a lot, I've been disturbed a lot about, you know, just listening to the women. They had a quest for interventions with perpetrators, with the men who oftentimes might be the father of their children. And so I was sitting here, my heart filled with what I'm hearing on a daily basis. Um, women saying that I don't necessarily want to end my relationship. I want the violence and the abuse to stop. What did she share with you? How did it affect her those years? When we talk, it was, do you realize how women are actually crying and they are with their husband or their boyfriend? Isn't that the space where you're supposed to be happy? And Susan, this is the kind of women that come into St. Anne's and they are really going through such hard times. They spoke about faith. They spoke about how God had carried them through. I also heard the struggle that they had with their faith community, because on, on the one hand, and it was such a strong point of strength and sustenance. And then when it came into their faith community, they had a different experience where they heard these messages being preached and taught around the role of women, and women were also always supposed to be submissive. And, and so there was always a conflict around, how do I satisfy God when in my intimate relationship I'm being abused and violated? Elizabeth's personal life was good. She'd married and had a son, Calum. But the pool continued between her Pentecostal roots and what she was experiencing in the real world through her work. Her feelings deepened after the birth of her son. When your son was born, you went into a, a spiritual crisis that propelled you into a leap of faith. Right. What was happening? What was the leap? I understood the importance of bringing another human being, a soul, into this earth, and my responsibility would be at least to have him in a spiritual space where he could discover God for himself. And that led me to, I really now had to decide whether I'm going to keep 
you know, keeping the peace and just doing my regular things in my current faith community or whether I'm actually leaping into the unknown. Very, very scary time. I was actually frightened and, and also angry with God in a sense that why are you, why are you taking me to, me to this place of wilderness spiritually? Elizabeth met Father John Oliver from St. Mark's Church in District 6, a mentor who helped her express her unique spirituality and listened intently as she spoke about engaging clerical leaders on the issue of family violence. Faith from whichever tradition is a source of hope, but it could also be a source of, that could easily be abused. And so my work was constantly moving me, or, or my heart was really moving me to an inter-religious context. And at the same time, I wanted to feel a sense of rootedness and security in my own faith tradition. And I think that is what John brought. got introduced to a different faith from what we had at the time because we were strongly Pentecost and, you know, doing the Anna Club thing. And then moving on to Anglican and really different, you know, she, she knew that's where she was going to be able to express and be able to do the work that she now wanted to do. pastor that I could share this vision of working broader than the church in an inter-religious context and he it wasn't strange for him and that was new. After 14 years Elizabeth resigned from St Anne's and decided to start the South African Faith and Family Institute working directly with clerical leaders across all faiths to truly engage the issue of domestic violence. It was something that had never been done before in South Africa. So Elizabeth, when you took the leap of faith and decided to start SAFI, you had to get going from nothing. I mean, what were some of the challenges that you experienced? You're absolutely right. I had no money. All I had was this gift, the office, and literally, having to eat one evening at one sister's house and then going to another sister because there was no salary. There were people that even offered me, you know, jobs. And it was like, you know what? How much time do we have to live in this life? And I didn't want to commit to something that I knew wasn't what I was supposed to do. Which is quite important for the field workers to build up themselves. So it's um, getting the names of faith. What do you make of what she did? <laughs> to me, I think by that time we knew Elizabeth was just pursuing a different journey. We will get up and go to workers. She was the one knowing the work that she needs to do couldn't be contained. Safi is working with but religious leaders from, whether it's the Muslim tradition, Hindu, Baha'i, Buddhist, Christianity, Jewish, so it's a wide range. South Africa is very diverse in its traditions, in its religious traditions. Violence against women happens in every faith tradition. So we have called everybody to account for the violence against women. We've called the police, the magistrate, the justice system, everybody. But we have not yet called religious leaders to account for the violence that happens with women in the intimate relationships. Elizabeth Peterson resigned a secure job to start an NGO that challenges religious leaders to confront issues of abuse in their communities. The South African Faith and Family Institute is a brave new step, a bold initiative that understands the huge impact that religious leaders can make. 
religious leaders are very, very powerful people in the lives of people coming into their faith communities. And I believe that religious leaders have a very, very crucial role in the faith formation and people's beliefs, you know, what they believe about themselves, what God wants from them, etc., etc. And so Sefi's work was not just going to be, you know, talking to faith communities about domestic violence, etc., etc. We were really going to invite and open a space of theological conversation. We wanted to talk about scriptures and teachings. What are the easily misinterpreted scriptures and those teachings that perpetrators use to justify the abusive behavior? I wanted us to, to think about the 16 days of activism, which you know is November, the end of November through to the 10th of December. The journey's not always been easy, as Elizabeth actively engages religious leaders to acknowledge abuse and to recognize that they're preaching to communities filled with countless survivors and perpetrators. In the first place, it was, I was now targeting religious leaders, total new area. And then I thought, oh my God, maybe the religious leaders are not going to listen to me. I mean, come on, I'm a woman. It required, it actually did require me to really get um, into my own intentions. What is this about? How do I deal with, with my own conflicts around the role of faith and what I've heard, how faith has been used to abuse? We have lost our moral compass and we are close to losing our human dignity. We are saying enough is enough for anyone who abuse our women and also our children. I think what, what I'm asking and what I've been asking religious leaders to do is a, is a challenge because many of them are men. And what, what has also become apparent that there may be some religious leaders who are perpetrators themselves. And it is in that context, because when a woman, an abused woman, come to you, she comes to you as this authority, this spiritual authority. And, and so I need it and I want religious leaders to get that. While working at St. Anne's, Elizabeth didn't only want to engage religious leaders. She also wanted to work with male perpetrators. It was not a popular view, but today she and others are doing important work with men. This work with, with men who abuse their intimate partners is really important because for me it links with, it is the essence of what women have been saying, we want interventions for our, for our partners. It's not condoning in any way or feeling sorry for. Not it's, at all. It's a real practical way of changing behavior. Some of the older men has real deep remorse for what they've done and they struggle because they don't know how can they change it and whether they ever will be able to change. You know, they realize the impact of, of what they've done. If we are talking about eradication of violence against women, we have to deal with the root causes. And for me, part of that is interventions with men. Yeah, things have been okay since two weeks ago. I was starting to focus on, on the negative things, you know. So I'm looking past the things that happen now because I'm taking responsibility for what I did wrong and... Do you really think that interventions with men will make a difference? Definitely. I really believe that we need to appeal to the humanity in men. Well, it's it's easy for us to work with victims and survivors. They come to us, right? But perpetrators, people who are actually causing the hurt, it's a little bit more difficult for us to engage because we often don't know what to do. How do we challenge in a loving way? When I work with perpetrators, I, I hear the yearnings even in themselves. 
you know, that they want to be different. They don't want to be, you know, in the places where they are. My eldest son, who I always felt fed off my anger, um, surprised me on Sunday and he hugged me from behind. We were, we were playing cricket on the field and he hugged me from behind and he said, Dad, I love you. And it shocked me because that's not the type of person he is. It shows that I'm growing because he's feeding off that, which is good. How do you keep chipping away at this? I remember the woman. I remember the voices. I remember the faces. I remember the children that had, you know, this hope. I mean, one child said to me a couple of years ago, couldn't anybody help my parents? You took a leap of faith that pulled the strands of your life together into the great purpose that you felt when you were little. I think for me the thread right through has been my parents. I have to say that. Because here was, you know, people not educated and they had lots of children, poverty and all of that. And there was these extraordinary individuals, each living their own purpose and loving, you know, and being together. I've never ever seen my dad being violent or abusive or shaming any one of us or my mother. I'm, I'm proud to, to, to see the work that she's doing and, and I think from my own experience, you know, the kind of intimacy that one can be in and when you sort of with your back against the wall, who do you go to, what do you talk about, who's helping you at what level. And her presence for me in the family is ensuring that I think none of the next lot of young girls in the family would be facing something as terrifying as being in an intimate relationship with no one to speak to. I believe each person has a piece of God in them and, and we all need to experience that peace that each one brings. But when we are violated and oppressed and abused, we can, that cannot come through. And so I think we must find ways to support each other, um, live you know, free and, and happy. Our world would be very different.